Welcome back to the European Open. I'm Matt Miller here in Berlin. Guy Johnson has just run out of the building at Finsbury Square around the corner uh, to Broadgate Circle and now is at ICAP standing by with uh, a very special guest. Guy, over to you. It's the ICAP Charity Day. We're here every year. We always get an opportunity to talk to Michael Spencer, the CEO. He is going to be changing hats very shortly. We're going to see the close of the next deal, we think, uh, by the end of the year. We now have a date for that, according to the uh, information we're getting. So let's get straight into the conversation with Michael, figure out exactly what's we're go what we're going on, uh, what is going on. So, A, what's going on here? Kind of this is the Euro interest rate swaps desk, yep. one of our most successful businesses in the world. Tremendous business, very multinational, you'll be pleased to note. Lots of French, Dutch, Italians, the odd Englishman here or there. Uh, but a great, a great business and uh, a, a great icon of the firm, where I started my job, actually, 30 years ago. Right, a bit of history, trip down memory lane for Michael Spencer. Um, you've given us now a timeline for when the, the, sort of the transition is going is to take place. Kind of walk us through what the next couple of weeks is going to look like. The deal will complete on the 30th December. It's a great deal. Obviously, our global voice broking business, these guys, all these guys around here, will be moving over to Pallet, Prebon, our traditional competitor, run by a good friend of mine, John Fizakali, who will be here later on. And that will be called TPI Cap, will be by a good margin the leading voice broking business in the world. And voice broking, by the way, as you can see, is by, is by no means uh, dead or anything like that. Actually, it's had a, a big recovery recently, particularly uh, since Mr. Trump was announced as the next president. I will be running the technology part of the business, which is EBS Broker Tech, our post-trade assets, our Euclid investment business, a few other assets, which will be rebranded Next Group, NEX Group. And um, so when I come back in the new year, I'll have a new business card, a, a new you, uh, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, of course, a considerable degree of sadness for me as well. The ICAP brand name is going. Many, many friends of mine are moving to the new TP ICAP vehicle. Yeah. I mean, I wish them every success, of course, but I will, candidly in private, I will shed a small tear. OK, let's talk about that small tear and how big that tear is actually going to be. Uh, as you say, the business is doing much, much better, stabilised over the last six months. Uh, in some ways, you can argue almost that you're kind of, you, you got out at the bottom, that maybe the trajectory is a little more uh, upward now. Well, I mean, bear in mind this, this deal is not a cash deal. Yeah. The current ICAP shareholders, including me, um, will receive... 56% of the shares of TP ICAP. They, they will be freely traded, so they can obviously choose whether to keep them or not to keep them. But nevertheless, the ICAP shareholders on the first trading day of January will own 56% of this mega global voice breaking business. So we are not getting out of the business, we're merely splitting it. Right. What are you going to do with yours? I, I, I don't talk in public about my private investments, but it's a very good business, TP ICAP. And they have a lot of things that they can do in terms of data, in terms of synergy costs. And John Fizakli, I'm sure, will lead it to great things. Let's, so you, you mentioned Donald Trump and what, the, uh, what this business has been doing as a result of what Donald Trump has done. The volatility has been certainly picking up a great deal. The market's priced in an awful lot when it comes to Donald Trump. The expectations, particularly when it comes to the equity business, but, uh, but other assets as well, uh, uh, have really risen. You see what's happened the bond market going in the opposite direction. Are, are we getting a little ahead of ourselves? Are we over our skis now? I mean, in fairness, forecasting market volatility, market volumes is always a mugs game. Whatever you say, you're 50-50 yeah. chop. But one thing I would say is we've had a, a sustained period, eight years now, of ultra-low interest rates that are flat and sort of pretty close to zero. We are now getting a yield curve for the first time in eight years. And that is one of the reasons these guys are busier today and have been busier in recent weeks than they have been in years. And a yield curve, once it goes like this, does not normally suddenly go flat back down so to the pancake. Are we, in, are we in the foothills of that steepening, or are we kind of... I, or are we I, I, I actually think we are. I really do. I mean, I think whether... I mean, equity valuations are a different thing than the rate market. And, you know, there are quite divergent views, obviously, about the equity market, and there are many who think current valuations are pretty high. We've had an eight-year bull market in equities. Valuations are pretty high. But the interest rate markets have been... Um, you know, they're, they're, there's... there's Indeed. So, I mean, I think the outlook for, for, for the interest rate market is 
I, I would say very probably 2017 is going to be a busier year overall than 2016 was. Okay, well, let's talk about why that's going to be and what is going to be the most volatile sort of elements of what 2017 looks like. As you say, maybe we're going to continue to see that curve steepening up. We've got a lot of political events to get through next year. Uh, Article 50, French election, German election, uh, and so much more. And the inauguration. In Italy yeah. and, you know, and there, there are more... I guess political uncertainties today than there have been for quite a long time. We don't know what uh, the interrelationship, for example, between China and the United States is going to look like going sure. forward. Um, the outlook for the European economy, um, you know, how the UK handles Brexit, and all of those many issues. So it is, um, you know, we are in uncertain times. Where, where do you think the focus is going to be? Is it going to be in BETPs? Is it going to be in OATs? Is it going to be? Kind of, where do you think? The, where do you think the real volatility is going to be? Well, you, in, the, in the rates market, you know, a high volatile U.S. interest rate almost invariably, since some, you know the, the U.S. dollar is still the global yeah. linchpin, volatility in U.S. rates almost invariably flows over into euro rates, sterling rates, Asian rates. So that is the centre pin. What happens in the United States? is really the, probably the most important question. Do you think, do you think, we're, do you think we're heading for inflation again? This has got a broader picture. Do you think... I, the answer, in my opinion, yes, but not immediately. Uh, I think um, uh, you know, productivity growth has still got some way to improve yet, but I think, um, I, I, I think you are, we are going towards the uh, end of next year. I think we're going to begin to see inflation begin to tick up. And it's very do, interesting. Do you worry about... Like, the, the, there are positives that the market is pricing in in terms of Trump's. And, and to kind of hold back to the question I asked a little bit earlier, the negatives could be there as well. Do you, do you worry that we're going to head for a world where trade is more difficult, that, that, that sort of moving money across borders becomes something that becomes harder and harder to do? And that, again, is going to feed back into all of this and it's going to become part and part of the, part of the narrative as well. It's true. I mean, Trump has represented... <coughs> pardon me, a... a um, quite a protectionist agenda in his rhetoric before the election. I sincerely hope he doesn't follow that through rigorously. And by the way, he's been pretty capable of shedding yeah. policies on the hoof. Trying on to understand many... what's going to happen is quite difficult. Uh, I, th I, th I think so, but certainly yeah. protectionism would do no good to the United States, nor Europe, nor any other part of the world. You know, the, 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 uh, you can argue various issues about global competition, but a, a, a return to a more protectionist world will do, do the globe no good service whatsoever. Do you, just, just finally, do you, do you think that Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, is, is now listening to the city, is now listening to British business? Yes, I, I think she is. Um, I mean, obviously, there were a few... Um, perhaps uh, ill thought out or ill considered early statements, but she's retracted on several of those. She's a she's a very capable woman, and I I, I definitely sense that she, Philip Hammond, the, uh, the Chancellor, um, are definitely uh, and indeed earlier this week. Uh, David Davis and Philip Hammond uh, had a meeting with several of the senior financiers um, to discuss Brexit. Yeah, do, you, do you worry about the cliff? This kind of fear that, that I hear from various bankers around the city of London that we're going to have for some sort of cliff that's going to affect businesses, that's going to mean that regulations change, change from one day to the other. Do you think there's now an understanding that we need some sort of a transition period? I think so. I, I think so. Um, a cliff would not be a good outcome. Um, I'm definitely, you know, a, in my opinion, a truly hard Brexit would not be a good outcome for financial services, and financial services are, you know, one of the biggest, well, the biggest taxpayer in the United Kingdom. You, I've no doubt saw the figures. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sure you saw the statistics the other day that um, uh, tax revenues from the financial services sector were over 70 billion, 71 billion pounds last year, the largest contributor of any business sector. So I, 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 I hope, expect that there will be some accommodation in terms of access for the City of London in financial services. And that would, I believe, be the right thing for the country as a whole, the economy as a whole. Michael, we look forward to seeing the, the deal close. We look forward to that transaction coming through. Congratulations again on another fantastic day here.
here. And I, and I hope these guys have a great day and, and, and you raise lots of money. Guy, thank you. Thank you very much for supporting us. Thank you for Bloomberg's effort. The great thing about this day is it's not just this office. Yeah. We've got 64 offices around the world, all of them today, whether it's Shanghai, Sydney, yeah. Wellington, later today, New York. Rio de Janeiro and all those great places where everyone in the firm is working for charity today. It's a wonderful, special thing that we're proud about, and thank you for your support. Thank you for inviting us. Michael, thank you very much indeed. Michael Spencer, the CEO of ICAP. Matt, back to you.